Well, good morning, everybody. We're excited to have you join us for this webinar. Uh, what a timely topic, how to take care of your employees so they'll take care of your customers. My name's Joe Staples. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer of Motivosity, and we're happy to bring this uh, uh, webinar to you. I'm joined by Jack Mackey, uh, who is a keynote speaker, breadth of experience uh, on this topic, and we're super excited to have him join us this morning as well. Just a couple of housekeeping items. Uh, first of all, we will be recording this webinar, uh, so we'll be sure and send you a link as soon as we conclude, and uh, you can share that uh, around with other colleagues and other people that may not be able to have been able to watch this live. Also, uh, we have planned a pretty extensive Q&A session at the end of, uh, of the presentation. And so uh, you've got an opportunity to submit those questions. You'll see something that either says questions or Q&A, click that, type in your question, send it over, and we will get to as many of those as we can in the time that we've got this morning. Again, super excited that uh, that you've joined us. You know, it's an interesting it's an interesting topic, and typically, it's something that's uh, tackled or handled very separately. Uh, you know, taking care of your employees is one subject. Taking care of your customers tends to be another subject. Uh, but what we've found in our research, and you're going to hear some great things from Jack, is that it's the combination of those two things where the power really comes in when uh, you focus on your employees and the impact that that can have on customer loyalty. So let me introduce Jack. He's, uh, he produces a uh, monthly video blog called the Jack Mackey Experience. He's been a keynote speaker at a number of events, uh, uh, a very prestigious career uh, and has done a lot of extensive work in this area specifically around customer loyalty, uh, loyalty in general, and the overall experience. So with that, I'll turn the time over to Jack. Hey, thanks a lot, Joe. Waiting for the screen share here to take over. It's saying I can't start it till the other participant stops sharing. Hey, there we go. We're off to a start. <clears throat> so, hey, there's the question. How can we expect our customers to love us if our employees don't? Huh? That's, a huff, that's a tough challenge. And I've uh, started off by just discovering that I started my slides at the end and not the beginning. So let me back up for a second here. <laughs> let me start, try this one more time. Jack, it wouldn't be a webinar if we didn't have a little, a little bit of uh, technical hiccups here. So true, so true, so true. But <clears throat> I promise everybody it'll be worth the wait, the 30 second wait while I get this back up to the beginning here. Okay, let's see. Are we all good? No, that, that looks bad too. Okay, we'll just have to do it like this. I apologize, everybody. Okay, here we go. How can we expect our customers to love us if our employees don't? Well, the answer is that that's impossible. <laughs> and so today we're gonna talk about uh, why that's important to figure out some way to solve that problem. And I'd like to kind of just start off by introducing kind of a common sense idea that I think everybody would agree all business is personal, goes where it's invited, it stays where it's appreciated. However, the sad news is in the United States, at least, uh, companies lose half their customers every five years, and they lose 20 to 50% of their employees, depending on their industry, according to research by uh, Fred Reichheld over at Bain. And the reason I want to bring this up to start with is I don't think this is new information, but I'm amazed at how few executives really get this. This is not just a hassle. This is their biggest danger and your biggest danger to growing your business. The absence of loyalty more than anything else restricts your growth. And on the other hand, 
within every industry, there are companies that are the premier leaders in customer and employee loyalty. I've been very fortunate to work with hundreds of these companies who excel at creating uh, great experiences for customers and employees. And over a period of about 20 years, they have double the compound average growth rate of their industries. That usually gets executives excited. And not only is the growth rate astonishing, but they actually save money by the, by the loyalty that they gain from employees. Clearly, they're going to lose turnover costs and they reduce their customer acquisition costs. So becoming a loyalty leader is really not just a worthy goal, but it's really the almost the only way you compete in a service-based business these days. So the, my, my belief over the years is the reason that these people can increase revenues and do it more profitably than other companies is because both their employees and their customers love the experience of doing business with them. And I'll just give you a couple of examples. If we go back to 1901, Nordstrom's began and they are still today America's top ranked department store. And they founded their company based on a philosophy of we're gonna take great care of our customers and they empowered their employees to make that possible. Um, shortly after that, 1916, Wegmans founded their grocery chain on the East Coast of the United States. And they've always been among the top three grocery chains in the United States ever since they were born. And from the year that the great place, greatest places to work list came out on Forbes magazine, Wegmans has been on that list every, every single year. And likewise with USAA Insurance, they were founded in 1922. And same thing, they were gonna feature, the way they took care of customers was how they sort of marketed themselves, but internally they got employee commitment that is unrivaled in the financial services industry. So I wanna point out here that this is not some just new management fad, this loyalty-based approach has been effective for over a century. And when the internet came along, you can see a lot of the companies here are internet-based. Let me just give you one example. Zappos was the first internet company to offer customers free shipping. They're an online retailer. They started off doing shoes. Now they do a variety of, of, of uh, retail clothing. But the point they, they started with is we're going to have great service and that's going to include free shipping to and back if you send it back. And we're going to give you a year to make up your mind if you really like those shoes or that shirt. In addition to that, in addition to that, they are, they live in Las Vegas or they're, they're in Las Vegas and they have a 24 seven live phone available for customers to call, which is unheard of in the retail industry. And in addition to that, they're also famous for one other thing, and that is Zappos is the company that invented the idea, let's pay our employees to quit. <laughs> yes, they said halfway through orient orientation or onboarding, about two weeks on the job, they call people in and they say, all right, this is your chance. If you don't love it here, that's okay. We could part friends, but we don't want you to feel like you're stuck in a job that isn't a good fit for you and that you're not committed to and they offer them two weeks salary to walk out the door right now. And as a result of that today, 80% of Zappos sales come from repeat purchases or from referrals of other highly satisfied customers. And that is all possible because of the commitment levels of their employees. I think sometimes there's so much talk these days about customer experience, employee experience that we lose sight of how powerful it is experience can change the way people think and feel and act. And to, to demonstrate that to you, I wanna tell you just a quick story. It's an old story, you might've heard it before, but bear with me because there's a great point coming along. So there was a group of uh, eighth grade girls and every day at school, they would sneak into the girls' bathroom over lunch and they would put lipstick on. And they had this ritual of everybody would kiss the mirror <laughs> as an end of that ritual. And the, and the uh, principal complained about it over and over, told them, ladies, you gotta stop that, it's bad for you, stop kissing the mirror, but they wouldn't quit. So one day the principal called a meeting of the girls right in the bathroom. And she said, young ladies, I brought our custodian Sam along with us so you could see how hard it is to remove your lip prints from the mirror. So Sam pushes open the door to a bathroom stall dips his long handled squeegee into the toilet water and begins scrubbing the mirror with it. 
So needless to say, there have been no more problems with lip prints. <laughs> now let's look at how that works. Whenever you have an experience, in that case, that was an extremely powerful negative experience that creates an emotion. In this case, it was an emotion of pure revulsion. And it immediately changes the way you think and feel about the fact that you've been kissing that mirror and it changes your action. You stop that immediately and you will never do that again. That's the power of experience. The good news is if you flip this upside down and you think about positive experiences, if your employees as well as your customers have continuous positive experience in working with you over time, that generates an emotion too. Only it's an emotion we call loyalty. And besides staying with you, loyal customers and employees do other things. They recommend you to their friends and family. They tell positive stories about doing business with you and working with you. And as a result of that, they actually bring you new customers and they bring you new talent. What they do, they help you drive growth. And there's more than a century of research proving that exceptional customer experiences and employee experiences drive exceptional growth. CEOs and CFOs are very keen on discovering those links. So let's start with that foundation. And now let me just give you a visual of sort of how it works. And I'll ask you to sort of answer to yourself first. I think you're gonna get the answers to these questions. But let's agree that sales and profit growth are sort of a fundamental requirement of the executive leadership of any company. My question to you is, where do the sales dollars come from? The sales dollars come from customers. Now they're not evenly distributed amongst customers though, are they? The most sales typically come from the, the most loyal customers. They buy the most over the most period of time. And so the, the following question is, well, yes, but what creates customers, what makes them loyal? And the way the research model works, it's a sustained over time, consistently highly satisfactory customer experience. And so those customer experiences that are consistently high over, what I mean by that is they can't just be ordinary, okay experiences or no problem experiences. They've gotta be remarkable. They've gotta be better than you can get from the competition. They've gotta be better than you're used to receiving. And when that happens, now you have sort of a circle here starting with a great experience, a remarkable experience, leading to loyalty, leading to sales and profit growth. Now, this next question, who creates those remarkable experiences? Is it the board of directors? Is it the CEO and the senior vice presidents? No, they have a lot to say about uh, providing the resources to make that happen, but who create these experiences? Obviously, employees. So now the question is, all right, well, how do you get employees to be different than other companies' employees so they'll create remarkable experiences. Well, it's kind of simple. You gotta create a great place to work. A great place to work is the same as a remarkable experience for employees. If you want them to give better service and take care of customers better than they ever have before, then you can't be just like every other company they worked for. Well, if you can create a great place to work, that leads to this thing called high engagement. That also gets a lot of talk. So let's boil it down to simple terms. High engagement means people are emotionally committed. They're committed to their company, to their customers, to their coworkers. And when they feel that way, they not only do they stay, but they also add a whole lot of value in terms of the high quality service that they provide. Now from the management point of view, we would say, oh, our employees create high quality service. But in this customer centric time, from the customer point of view, they say that company delivers a remarkable experience. So now we have a foundation here. Let's get into a case study. I'm sure you've heard of SafeLight. They're advertising like crazy now, SafeLight Auto Glass. But they are a unique organization in that they are in what's called the negative services category. That means nobody really wants to do business with safe like auto glass. I mean, they're famous for bringing their van to your car or office to fix your broken windshield. So that isn't gonna be one of your greatest days if you're a customer. But what they do is when they're doing the repair, there's a, a, 
an epoxy resin that needs about 10 minutes to set before they can go on to the next step. Well, in that time, the friendly service technician vacuums the customer's car and shines all their windows without saying a word about it. So when the customer comes out and sees the finished product, wow, they're excited, they're happy, they're unexpectedly having a positive experience of what they thought would be, you know, kind of a lousy day. And as a result of that, you can see Safe Life has figured out some ways to demonstrate exactly why employee commitment and customer commitment uh, lead to better business performance. For example, they decided that because most people, when they break their windshield, they don't have any experience buying, you know, glass repair services. So they have to ask their friends or their family or go online and look at reviews to see, you know, who's the best choice. And so over the years, what we've noticed at Safe Light is that in the last 10 years, they were able to increase their NPS score from, as you can see, 71 to 84. And I'm telling you, an NPS score in the mid 80s is outstanding. Quick, quick refresher, NPS score is you take the, the promoters, the, the percent of your customers that love you so much they're willing to recommend you. And you subtract, sub, subtract from that your detractors, the customers that haven't had such a great experience, and that is your net promoter score. And it's been proven over and over again that there is a direct connection between increases in net promoter scores and increases in growth. And over a period of 10 years, this was the results that you saw at SafeLight. So let me give you a little of a backstory on this company. SafeLight was actually founded in 1947 in a junkyard in Wichita, Kansas. They started off as a manufacturer of auto safety glass. So they really weren't a service oriented company so much as they were a manufacturer. Well, over as time went by, uh, in about the year 2000, they, they got into a little trouble. They grew a little too fast and they, and they went through a bankruptcy and they were back on their feet by 2008 and a new CEO named Tom Feeney came on the job. And as the new chief architect of the business, he was asking himself the question I started with, which was, how can we continue to get great returns for our shareholders consistently in the future if they don't love us, if they're not loyal to us, if they won't recommend us? And the follow-up question was, and how can we expect them to do that if our own customer, if our own employees won't love us and be loyal to us? So Tom Feeney introduced this idea that if you want your employees to feel more passionately loyal towards your company, the first place to look is at yourselves as leaders and scaling up the leadership in, at SafeLight started with giving them their first ever leadership training. So they called it uh, people-powered leadership training. And it was a very simple concept. It was based on four ideas and they, they called these pledges and they made these pledges to their mid-managers, a thousand of them. And this was the first pledge they made to their mid-managers. Look, you're going to experience great leadership. We know we've, we haven't talked about it a lot in the past. We've been focused on operations and, and we've been manufacturers. But going forward, our absolute commitment is to providing you with a great leadership experience. You're going to be respected. You're going to be recognized for the hard work you do. And you're going to be kept informed of everything that affects your job and your career. Second, we're going to promise our focus is on you first. We realize we're not going to win customer loyalty unless you all feel valued. So we're going to, what are we going to do? We're going to provide you with professional development. We're going to provide you with technical training. We're going to provide you with everything you need to feel confident that you are building a successful career for yourselves here at SafeLight. Also, third, we are going to hire top talent. And that means all of your coworkers as well as yourself, we're going to keep you prepared with ongoing training, but we want to hire people that we know have the right attitude towards being successful because people like to work with other winners. And we promise you're going to be on a team with people who want to win. And finally, Safe Light's been in business a long time and we've always had a big heart. In fact, our goal has been nothing less than to give unexpected happiness to our customers. And that includes our employees and our suppliers. So this is the this is the training that they gave. And then the thousand field managers went out and trained the 6,000 technicians spread across 700 locations. And that's how they were able to form a partnership with their employees and their managers that led them to the success I shared with you. 
Now, of course, you're never finished and they knew they weren't done. And I don't know, that's just how it is in business, right? Competition's always raising the bar. But personally, I found over my career that the challenge to constantly get better, that's really what keeps the fire in the belly. In fact, I'd be willing to bet that all of you that are on here, you, you came to this webinar, why? To get better, right? To, to, get, to get re-inspired and maybe to learn some new ideas that will help you improve your organization. So if you like stories about other successful businesses, let me offer you a, a gift. Uh, Joe mentioned that I have a video blog and it's because I think I learn better by hearing how other people have actually achieved success, financial, with employees, and with customers. And so I publish this blog every month. And if you'd like to have sort of a steady stream of, of true stories with fresh ideas about how empowered employees generate successful growth in organizations, just send me an email to jack at jackmackey.net and I'll put you on my list. And if you, if you send that to me today, I will send you these three that are on here for Anytime Fitness, uh, Enterprise Car Rental, and Umpqua Bank, which have amazing stories that you can all learn from. So to wrap up here, I started by saying, you know, how can we expect our employees to love us if our customers don't? And I think we agreed the answer is, well, that can't be done. Loyalty inspiring experiences start at headquarters. And it is you leaders in the area specifically of employee engagement and employee motivation. It's your leadership and your passion shared with your co-executives and all of the other management levels in your companies that will make that happen. So Joe, over to you. Thanks, Jack. Uh, good information. Uh, love, uh, love your perspective perspective on this, the experiences that you've had, love the stories that you shared there. So thank you for that. Let me bring up my slides and you'll see that, so Jack, if you can stop sharing now, uh, you'll see that uh, what I have to present really dovetails in with, uh, with, with Jack's message and at the same time, uh, hopefully adds just a few more new concepts to you. Uh, so again, my name is Joe Staples. I'm the CMO of Motivocity, and I'm gonna give you a 30 second uh, infomercial on Motivocity. Uh, we are an employee recognition uh, software platform, uh, allows companies to allow their uh, workers to give small monetary bonuses to their peers just for doing great work. And the result of that is it creates this wonderful culture where people collaborate and love working together and feel appreciated for the work that they do. Uh, we've got the absolute best uh, companies as our customers. Some of the great brands, greatest brands in the world uh, use Motivocity. I told you it was 30 seconds. It was only about 20 seconds. So you owe me 10 seconds on that one. All right, I'm going to start off with a, with a quote here. Uh, and, and this really is the core to what Jack and I are, are talking about. Uh, it's from Bain and Company. Companies are finding that a loyal workforce uh, does more than reduce the cost of churn. It also delivers more loyal customers. Armed with new evidence providing the link between motivated employees and customer loyalty, business leaders are prioritizing investments in employee engagement. So focusing on the customer is absolutely nothing new. Uh, businesses recognize that, you know, if, they're, if their customers aren't happy and their customers aren't loyal, um, they're not gonna have a business. Uh, the thing that is really trending heavily in, in the positive direction is that businesses as Bain uh, specifies here, are finding the link between that employee experience and the customer experience. Essentially, the, the title of the webinar, Take Care of Your Employees and They Will Take Care of Your Customers. So, you know, the very first thing is uh, to ask yourself that question, do you, do you buy into that fact? Do you buy into the concept that if you, if your employees are engaged and loyal and motivated, 
uh, that that is going to result in positive outcomes for your customers. If you do buy into that, if you do believe that, then what I would propose is that there's two things that you need to do. The, the very first one is you need to establish a partnership between HR and the CX group, uh, sometimes called client success or, or the service group. Interesting, and I think this is one of the challenges that we'll see uh, companies have to o- overcome as they, as they buy into this concept and then tackle it as a challenge, is those are typically two very distinct parts of the organization. HR people wake up every morning thinking, yep, we're responsible for the employees. Their motivation, their happiness, their engagement, their, uh, their benefits, everything employees, that's us. And then you've got the CX group or client success group that wakes up every morning going, we are responsible for the loyalty of our customers and everything that, uh, that goes around that. So if these two groups are going to work together, uh, you're going to have to have a relationship built there. Uh, both leaders in both of those teams and organizations are going to need to buy into the fact that, yeah, th- this is how we're going to do this. We're going we're gonna to see our NPS scores go up because we're going to focus on our employees. And the, the, the challenge is if you get a CX leader that looks at the HR person and says, yeah, that sounds like a really great message. Let me know when you're done with that. That's, uh, that's not a plan for success. So it really is these two groups working together. So that first step is to, to establish uh, that relationship between those two groups so that both groups are bought in and working on this problem together. Second is to focus on the primary motivators for employee engagement. Uh, So Boston Consulting Group, again, bunch of smart people, uh, did an extensive study and they found that the top three uh, motivators or factors in employee engagement are that the employee feels recognized and appreciated for the work that they do, that they have a good solid relationship with their boss or manager And then third, that they feel this sense of belonging to the organization. So it's one thing, you know, I think just about every organization that's uh, got any maturity to it says, yes, we do things for our employees, but it's really important to focus on the right things to make sure that you're really going after what will move the needle relative to employee engagement or employee motivation. One of the things that we see very frequently is we call it a counterfeit culture um, where uh, companies use perks as things to uh, what they think uh, motivates uh, their employees. And uh, everything that has really been published by just about uh, every analyst firm, certainly it's what we've seen, is those perks uh, are good to attract talent. You have a candidate comes into your building and you take them around and people are riding hoverboards or going in, you know, mini electric cars or you show them the nap room or the, uh, you know, the, the free lunch on Wednesdays. All of those perks tend to cause people to go, wow, this is, this is neat. This is a great culture. Those are very, very temporary in the impact that they have on the long-term motivation and engagement of your employees. And what they do at the leadership level is they create a false sense of security. They, you know, the leadership looks and says, yeah, we're doing all of these things. Our employees must love it here. How come our, how come our uh, employee satisfaction scores aren't higher? And they face that challenge. So the, the message there is that perks aren't long top term motivators. They may be great marketing for attracting candidates, but if your um, employee engagement program or uh, strategy is built on perks, it's uh, set up to fail. So uh, it really comes back to these three items and, and focusing on these three items. 
recognition and appreciation for the job that, uh, that I'm doing, uh, building a great relationship with my boss or manager, and having a sense of belonging to the organization. When employees feel those things, that's when you'll see the scores change dramatically, and that is when you'll see uh, engagement that then affects customer loyalty actually take place. Fly our lady away there. Um, so I wanted to just uh, kind of take this in the context of the time that we're living in. Uh, so, you know, rewind uh, back to January. Um, there were, everybody was in the office. There was water cooler talk. I don't know if water coolers actually still exist, but the, the metaphor is, is still applicable. And now what we find is what's left in the office is the water cooler and everybody has gone home and is, and is working from home. So it, that creates even a, a, certainly a different dynamic, uh, but creates a, a greater challenge of how do we engage these employees now that they're working from home and, uh, and many of them will be working from home for the foreseeable future. So, um, as, as you think of what you did when, uh, and most of this would apply to the HR leaders who, who took the lead on this, um, and I call it the new now, not the new normal. I, 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 I think it's going to change, but it's what we're experiencing now. Uh, but when you realized or got the directive that, okay, you know, we're going to need to take all our people and have them work from home, you scrambled around, you were best friends with the, with the head of IT and providing your employees with great productivity tools. So you made sure their email was set up and they had a Slack channel and uh, you got them Zoom licenses so that they could participate and, and lead Zoom meetings. Um, you made sure that they had a good reliable computer, uh, Wi-Fi that had sufficient bandwidth to do everything that they need to do, good quality headset, so, you know, at, at the end of the couple of weeks that that might have taken, uh, most HR leaders that I've talked to kind of let out this big sigh of relief of, yes, we got them all redeployed to, to working from home. And they cited all these tools that they had, had set up. But the real question then becomes, okay, so you've got them productivity tools, what have you done relative to their engagement? Uh, and, and some people go as far as talking about mental health, uh, but uh, you know, even if we leave it just at engagement, what have you done to help them uh, fully engage in this new now while they're working from home? So um, we live in this online, very social world. Here I'm using a screenshot of motivosity uh, to illustrate the point. Um, but, you know, a, a social application is something that employees, that people are, are used to. Uh, so that's the approach that motivosity takes. So we uh, designed the UI in a very social way. So what you're looking at here is, uh, you know, where people would go in, appreciate a coworker who helped them with something, stayed late, completed a project ahead of schedule, whatever it happens to be. And they're able to, to give some, some money as a peer uh, to, to their coworker. But the most important thing is that then shows up in this social feed for everybody to see. And so going back to those primary motivators, staying connected uh, with my workforce was one of the primary ones. That takes place here because I'm still connected. I still see the work that other people are doing. Uh, and then certainly the feeling of appreci being appreciated or recognized for the work that I do uh, is done as well. So the main point here is don't stop once you feel that you've given your employees all the productivity tools that they need. Take it a step further and say, how do I how do I deliver the engagement that employees need to stay upbeat, to stay motivated, to stay engaged uh, so that they'll continue to, as, uh, as the crux of what we're talking about here, so that they'll continue to, 
look after and, and provide great service to our customers. So um, if your employee engagement initiatives are dependent on people being in the office, welcome to the 80s, uh, because that's really the design of those things. Uh, recognition walls, bringing everybody together in, in big meetings and then recognizing four or five individuals for something that they did, uh, providing uh, a, a recognition salad bar on a Friday uh, lunchtime. All of those things are dependent on everybody being in the office. So even before we got this, uh, this new now with uh, COVID-19, there were still you know, just about every business had some number of remote employees or work from home employees. Those people always felt um, excluded uh, from the things that went on in the office. Think of it now while everybody's working from home. So our recommendation is certainly to, to, to not be bound by uh, physical locations in the way you engage and motivate your employees so that they'll care for your customers. So, uh, you know, just to summarize my, my three points, uh, the first one is to create this partnership between HR and, and CX to help improved employee engagement drive improved customer loyalty. I, I really think it's, uh, it's a stretch. If you don't have that partnership, I think you're gonna be lucky if, uh, if you actually have the connection between employee engagement and, and customer engagement. It'll happen for some, it'll happen for those that are kind of on the front lines, customer facing people, um, but it's really this uh, relationship that you can build that will have it spread throughout the rest of the organization. Point number two, focus on the primary motivators, not the perks, not the little periphery things, but the primary motivators of employee engagement uh, don't create any counterfeit cultures. And then approach your initiatives in a location independent way. Um, just uh, that, is, that is the inclusive way to make sure that all of your employees are uh, being motivated in, in the same way and that that's then translating into this customer engagement. So we'd love to help you. Uh, and doesn't have anything to do with uh, buying Motivocity software. If you are in the process of looking at this connection between employee engagement and, and customer engagement, if you're designing an employee engagement process or program, we'd love to consult with you on it. No obligation. Uh, and so I list at the bottom of the screen, uh, three different ways to connect with me and uh, we'll get one of our consultants to uh, just have a conversation with you. So we'd love to do that. With that, we will start our Q&A session. So um, again, you've got uh, some, uh, you've got a button that either says Q&A or, or says questions. Joe, are you still there? You might have lost him. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> and, and that's great. So yeah. uh, uh, are you able to see the uh, Q&A? I see one question here. Let, let me see. Jared Olson wrote, I love the example you shared about Zappos. They're doing some very cool things, shaping the customer experience. How do you think Holacracy, Holacracy has influenced the customer experience since they have deployed it? <clears throat> I've been a big fan of Zappos for a long time, Jared. And when they first came out with Holacracy, well, actually they didn't invent it, but this whole idea was they're not gonna have any leaders. <laughs> 
So they had, uh, they struggled with it at first in, internally, but I haven't, I haven't heard any evidence that it had a negative influence on their customer experience. So I guess unless you're inside the company, and, and maybe some of you are, who are on, on the webinar have, have experienced with, within Zappos right now, you might have some internal information, but externally, their performance, uh, their customer loyalty scores and all that seem to have remained positive, but I don't know that there's been a research paper, you know, vetted, put out by the Harvard Business Review or something like that. Anyway, by the way, any of you in the audience, if you ever get a chance to visit Zappos in Las Vegas, after the pandemic is over and you're allowed to go do that, that is one of the coolest, most inspiring physical experiences you can have. And I can't tell you, I've never had an experience like it. You've got to go see Zappos in Las Vegas. Hey, I bet you could probably go to Zappos for fun and just go there for a day of it and it would be a business trip. <laughs> Jack, I'm back. Welcome back, Joe. Thanks for handling that question. And I'm glad it, <laughs> I lost my internet connection, uh, not in the middle of the presentation. Hey, hey Jack, uh, one of the next questions is, how do you get executive buy-in to these kinds of programs? So, uh, you know, and I think we see that. We see HR leaders and CX leaders uh, who are, you know, the, the direction they're getting from the top is, hey, just, uh, you know, keep turnover down and, and keep uh, customers buying things. But then when they come up with a program that says, hey, we, we wanna do some of these initiatives, uh, what are some of your tips on how to get buy-in from the top? Sure. One of the things that I mentioned first in my presentation is where I would recommend that HR leaders start in conversations with their CX teams or their executives, and that is gee, look at how successful some of these other companies are, the great reputations they have and the positive relationships that they have with their employees and, and the, the, the margins that they're earning and the leadership they have in their industries. What are, they, what are they doing? And when you start off with how they are successful as a business, that is what business people are interested in. So, you know, the toughest sell are always going to be to CFOs and financially oriented executives that want to know before I spend a dime on anything, I want to know what's the return. And so I, I would admit the first thing to do is just take that issue off the table, say the most successful companies, very likely in your industries, are those that show up on the great places to work list that show up in the upper quartile or upper decile of the American Customer Satisfaction Index that have the highest uh, NPS score. So I think the correlation is established. And uh, I would start by making sure that, that that's the foundation of why you're interested in it. You're interested in it, not just because it's the right thing to do and you have humanistic philosophy, but you're interested in it because this is the way you're going to survive. You know, this is the way you're going to attract and keep the best employees. And as I pointed out, it's, it's really not the CEO delivering the experience. It's, it's that frontline employee. That's how I would deal with it. Yeah, I agree, Jack. I, I think the other thing that we've seen is, you know, there's always a concern of, well, well this cost us money. And, and, you know, given the current environment, um, that's certainly something that is hypersensitive uh, now. And one of the things where we've seen uh, companies be successful is they've looked at what money they're already spending and many of them can get to a really good, solid, comprehensive program, almost at a, at a budget neutral way. You know, you think of how many gift cards, you know, somebody gets the admin and sends them out, go buy a bunch of gift cards. And you come together in a meeting and you're handing out uh, the gift cards. And then you think of a lot of these other perks, which, as I mentioned, are short term uh, incentives. As you think about those, if you take the, the money that's being spent on those and put them into something that's you know, really focused on employee motivation that drives customer loyalty, oftentimes you can see that uh, you can go to a CFO or a CEO and say, hey, here's what we want to do. And by the way, we figured out how to do it at a, at a near budget neutral way. 
Um, again, uh, if you have questions, type them in. Uh, Jack, I think this one's probably for you because it says that you mentioned it. So you talked about a great place to work. Uh, and uh, can, you, can you say a little bit more about that? Yes, yes, that's something that I've been fascinated by for years. The expression, great place to work, is actually the name of an organization that partnered up with Fortune Magazine. I think it has to be 21 years ago now. And they surveyed, and of course, they started with all big companies. Fortune 500 companies. But over the years, they've done these surveys for different size companies in different industries. And to, to use their definition, it, it, it says a great place to work is where you trust the people you work with and for. You have great pride in the work that you all do together. And you enjoy camaraderie with your coworkers. That is the definition provided by great place to work the organization. And I think that covers a lot of what we've talked about today, right, Joe? So you've talked about the, the idea of people having to feel confident that they're enjoying recognition, but recognition is not a one, a one and only way to do it. A lot of times it's camaraderie. It's having, it's having humor and enjoyment in the workplace. It's having trust between, uh, leaders and uh, their team members. And uh, that comes from uh, a lot of things. I mean, it's complex, it's an organization, it's a big human organization, but trust is kind of the foundation. You know, trust includes people, people trust their leaders, they think they're competent, they know, they know what they're doing, and that includes they know that taking care of the employees is a crucial part of that. They um, frequently trust involves respect. And respect are things like giving people credit for what they do, but it also means things like, you know, investing in people. Professional development, for example, is one of the least expensive investments you could get today with all the online courses and, you know, free information online that you can get. The way the company invests in people to develop their skills, that's a sign of respect. And, and, and it also makes people feel valued. And I guess, the one other thing I would say is I think there's a, there's a difference now between leaders who still lead by the old command, do what I say, when I say, follow policies, get in line, and people that are more collaborative. And they're more collaborative, not because they can't boss people around, but they just found out it works better if people feel like they're involved in decisions and they're treated, again, with respect. Like, you know, we are all equals as human beings. And the fact that somebody's got a leadership title doesn't make them a better human being. And so I think humility amongst leadership is very appealing, especially when it's backed up with, you know, they're an effective leader, they know what they're doing, they know the business, and they're very effective in, in developing relationships with employees as well as customers. Thanks, good. A um, Couple of questions that kind of go together. One, uh, they ask, uh, you know, Jack, you brought up NPS. Um, they ask what the measurement is for employee, the employee version of NPS. And then the, the other question that I kind of throw in uh, the same bucket is uh, someone is looking for how to quantify uh, loyalty. And I'll just take a, a, you know, a quick stab at this. I, I think the quantification of this is, is very straightforward. I mean, this is very, very measurable. These are not uh, soft items that you can't really understand the, the ramifications. So uh, there's NPS, Net Promoter Score, uh, where you're measuring the satisfaction level of, of customers. There is an ENPS score, where you're measuring uh, the satisfaction of your employees. And the the most, uh, the, the core ENPS question that most people use is, I tell my friends that they should work here. That's been proven that that really proves how much of a promoter you are. You may say, yep, I've been, I've been here for 10 years. Yeah, I like it. Yeah, they're nice to me. Yeah, I like my job. Would you tell your friends to work here? Uh, you know, all of a sudden it gets squishy. So that's a great question uh, to measure this. So to look at the correlation, and I think that's really what you 
what you should do is the correlation between watching that ENPS score move relative to moving the NPS score. Um, uh, you know, anything over a 30 on ENPS is respectable, uh, but we're seeing people, uh, you know, in 70s and 80s, uh, you know, really, really engaging with their employees. Jack, anything to add to that? I just have one comment. It's just, it's kind of a vocabulary difference. People use the words satisfaction. And, and I think in talking about the employee experience, that's, that's one way of measuring it. In fact, there's a whole set of measurements called overall satisfaction people companies been using for years but if you go straight to why do you want people to be satisfied it's because you want them to be loyal and that's true whether it's customers or uh, employees and so the nps system is basically designed to go straight to loyalty so it's understood that if you're not satisfied you're not going to be loyal but instead of asking about how satisfied you are they did about 10 years worth of research and they tried out all these questions to take the data and correlate the answers to this question with the growth of the company or the companies that they were using. And they found that saying, how likely are you to recommend our company to your friends and colleagues, assuming our business is appropriate for them? And the recommendation question was closer in correlation than the satisfaction question. So I just would point that out that being highly satisfied is, is an important metric, but the, the loyalty metric is the one that is more closely correlated to growth, revenue growth. And also, this is another element to profitability because when you lose high cost of customer and employee acquisition, when, you have, when you've got a line of people out the door, like at Zappos, I think I've heard somebody say it's harder to get into Zappos than it is to get into Harvard. <laughs> I mean, so that's my two cents on it, I think. Loyalty is, is the main thing to keep in mind. Loyalty is, is valuable in many, many ways. And, and NPS measures have been correlated with growth, increases in growth, and been published in many journals. And just check the Harvard Business Review or go on Google and just say, type in, you know, show me correlations between NPS scores and, and uh, financial success. Yeah, I th you know, I think the other interesting fact around this is that it doesn't just happen. You know, you can't just run around and say, hey, everybody, take good care of our customers. Be, you know, be more engaged with our customers. I mean, you can say that over and over again. It becomes white noise. You really need to put some things in place that create some dynamics and some changes where your employees are motivated to do that. I mean, they feel this sense of ownership around the company and they, and they want to, uh, to deliver for, for their customers because they feel so tightly coupled with the company. Mm -hmm. Jack, just uh, let's, let's, let's squeeze in two last ones. Uh, this one, uh, the person asks about barriers to creating a, a caring culture. Uh -huh. you know, this culture where, okay. where there's, yeah. I'm Thought smiling. I'm just smiling because my own personal experience here, I, of course, there's a lot of published stuff on this, but let me just share some information about, I spent about 15 years working with companies to measure their, their customer and their employee engagement and loyalty and things like that. And, and within our own company, this was a, a significant sized company and we had you know, 350 employees in multiple countries and locations and yada, yada, yada. Well, the biggest barrier to, getting people to have camaraderie, which is a big part of being engaged, right, Joe, is there's de interdepartmental conflict. And that interdepartmental conflict creates constant challenges for leadership. And that's not going to go away. However, what we did at, at, at the company I was working with, Service Management Group, is we, we didn't, Motivosity hadn't been invented, I don't know, 15 years ago, Joe, but no. we, we, we saw the need for recognition and peer-to-peer -peer recognition. And by giving, we took SharePoint and figured out, our IT guys figured out some easy way that you could give high fives to people online. But the rule uh, was you had to give them to somebody outside of your department. And so that was a great way of, you never totally eliminate conflict in, in, in the priorities between various departments, but 
you get you can show a lot more respect when you're acknowledging people across departmental lines. And then senior management is acknowledging those people that are giving peer to peer recognition. So I guess the barriers will always be there. It's, it's, it's how, how can you act to overcome them? How can you mitigate them? And uh, I think that peer to peer recognition is one of the best ways that you can do that. Don't make it all about management giving recognition. Let it be more about employees recognizing each other and across departments has been really valuable in my opinion. Yeah, so so true. We've, uh, you know, oftentimes we'll go into an organization that has focused on recognizing their employees. I mean, it's pretty rare to find a company that says, now we don't do anything for our employees. I mean, they, they recognize them, but in most cases, it's what we call a top-down approach. And you reference the word trust uh, during your presentation. That is huge. And trust is, is not garnered very readily when things look like they're top down. People, people wonder why so-and-so has won this award three times and I work just as hard as them and I haven't ever won it. And, and you know, kind of that just gets perpetuated throughout the organization. Contrast that with a bottoms up approach, which says peers, we're just going to turn you loose. Go recognize all the great work that's going on around you. And I think that just crushes one of the barriers. One of the other barriers is the silos. You know, most, you could work in a company of a thousand people and you may know 20, you know, you know the people in your department and in the department that you work with closely. If you can break that barrier down through sharing, uh, uh, um, interests that people have, stories that people have. Gina, I'm actually going to read this really quick. Gina, one of, uh, one of the participants today, she said that uh, they started something where they send out quizzes focused on individual employees. And that's one of the ways that they get employees to learn of, about each other. Well, we've got two minutes left. Jack, uh, so you get a minute and I get a minute. Uh, final, final thought as you think of this concept of uh, taking care of your employees so that they will take care of your customers. What, what's a, a summary point that you'd share with the audience? Well, first, Joe, thanks for inviting me and for everybody who joined. I, I know that I don't know you personally, but I would be more than happy to be of service to you in any way I can. I've already said Love to share my blog with you. If you like learning through stories, that's kind of my thing. I'm happy to share that. And also, I would love any of you who have success stories to tell, like, like Gina just told that success story. I would love to hear your success stories as well as your challenges. Uh, hook up with me on LinkedIn. I'm at Jack Mackey at LinkedIn. <laughs> and uh, it would just uh, be my pleasure to be of any help to you that I can be, especially in this time. Thanks again, Joe. Thanks, Jack. Uh, you know, I think... I think for me, I, the summary point that I would share is, I believe if, if you're really looking at having an impact on your business, it really is around how you can develop greater customer loyalty. And then take one step removed from that, how can you then have that, the greatest impact on customer loyalty? It is by engaging your employees. If you've got an engaged, uh, workforce that just loves the business, feels appreciated, uh, has this great relationship with their coworkers and their managers, they're going to take care of your customers and you're going to see some great responses from that. Again, thanks to everybody who joined us. Uh, and uh, as mentioned, we will send out a recording of this and would love to engage further with you. Thanks everybody. Have a great day. Bye.